It's wonderful to see all of us here this morning as we continue studying God's Word, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. And today we are in chapter 9, maybe we'll finish chapter 9 today, but we begin from verses 23. We have seen the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, how the Lord appeared to him when he was on his way to go and bring people to Jerusalem, bound in chains. And instead of arresting people, the Lord arrested him instead. Uh, he went three days without sight and without food, and a revival began in his heart because the Lord was with him and the Lord was working in him. In him. The Lord told Ananias that he is my chosen, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And right in this chapter, before we conclude it, with the miracles that we'll see, we see that he's begun the suffering. The Lord had promised, and for sure, the Lord keeps his promise. <laughs> he doesn't change his mind and say, well, probably it will be so painful. But at the end of the day, if, it is the, if it's a way that is ordained by God, you can be sure that you go through it and you'll be victorious because it is God who has sent you in there. So before we read, let us ask for God's blessings. God, we thank you again for this day. We thank you that you have seen it well to give us a day to come before you and just to... Uh, go through your word as we normally do, but we don't take it for granted that we have life today. And as we read through, we ask that your Holy Spirit would uh, open our hearts to receive that which you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we will be talking briefly about the sufferings of this Paul, Saul guy, and also the uh, tranquility and the peace and the prosperity that we see here and the miracles, all these things in this portion that we have. But at the end of it, I see it as the prosperity of the church. Regardless of whether there was suffering and there was no suffering, the church is prospering because it is of God. The church exist to be what it is today because it is God's. So last week, as we saw, um, after Saul of Tarsus received his sight, he was given food to strengthen his body. And the Bible told us in verses 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come for that purpose, that he might bring them bound in the chief priest? But as they're having disputes in their hearts and talking to one another, this soul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. So this becomes everything for Paul to always prove that Jesus Christ is God. That is why Jesus said that he is my chosen vessel to bear my name, 
to bear my name. In verses 23, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciple took him by the night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. A lot of things to talk about here. But you will realize if you, you know, you've read other letters of Paul, he'll give us other details that Luke here doesn't give to us. In between verses 22 and 23, is a big number of days that he didn't mention to us, but Paul himself is gracious to tell us of what happened. If you would go with me to um, Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Let me begin from verses 15. This is what Paul now says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created and that are in heaven and under the earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the body, that is the church. Who is the beginning in the firstborn from the dead? That in all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father in him, in the fullness. He should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven... Or things made, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And to you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by your wicked works, yet he has reconciled. Now think about that for a moment, church. What Paul is saying to us through the cross. Think about the cross right now. What is Paul trying to tell us that we were all alienated through our bad deeds and we were not able to bring ourselves to God, but through what he did at the cross, we are now able to receive life. I saw of Tarsus, this was me. I was alienated. From him, I was separated from him. He says again in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with the flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. So we see his, you know, kind of trying to tell us who he was before, but again, he's giving us a context to know what happened after he was conf uh, 
uh, converted, that it pleased the Lord. The Lord appeared to him. He got born again. He received Jesus Christ. But then, you know, when things got out of hand, you know where he went to? He went to Arabia. So in between these two verses that we have, verses 22 and 23, for three years, he went there. And other commentators would suppose that the area, specific area that Paul went to, was just close to the mountain where God's law was given to Moses. And him being, you know, a, a person who is so learned about the matters of law, the Torah in his hands and all these things that he's gone to school for, when the Lord arrested him, he began a journey of thinking, a journey of, you know, reviewing the truth of God's word. This same God that I have read about, this same God that prophecies have gone out about, Jesus Christ, he did give his law to his people through Moses, Mount Sinai. And so as he went to this region just trying to think about, trying to figure out things in his mind, I believe the Holy Spirit led him. If for any other young believer, you get born again, you know, you just want to go and, you know, fellowship with other believers, right? The people who are already walking with the Lord and you, you, you want encouragement from them. But right away, that is not what Paul does. He stays for, for a while in um, Damascus, but he chose to go to uh, a different location to go and review what he has to do. The Lord has forewarned him that this is what you're going to do. You're going to suffer for my name's sake. So as you're thinking about it, you know, think about it. You know, you come to church, it's, it's your first time. You, you, you haven't had have, uh, fellowship with people. You don't know how people be, behave in church. And you, you don't even know what to say. You don't know how to pray in church. You don't know a lot of things. And you, you're here getting excited and you're getting born again and everything is fresh. And then they tell you that now that you have joined us, now that you're here, your life is marked with suffering. What a good introduction for someone who wants to be a believer. Your life is not your best life now. It is the suffering that is marked for you. That is what you're going to think about. These are the things you're going to encounter. And it didn't go for a long time before he begins to experience those exact things. He said, No, did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me? But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So when he returned to Damascus, that is where we find ourselves in verses 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. They plotted to kill him. You know the reason why they plotted to kill him? Because everything he does right now works against the Jewish people. Everything works against them. He was one of them, and it was, you know, that is why, if I would go back, this is why Jesus told him, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. There's a conviction in you. There's, there's something that you know for sure, but you're trying to fight it. He's trying to fight it.
Maybe his other colleagues are also fighting, but they just don't know. And their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates. This means they, this, this city was a fortified city. There, was, there were walls around it. They would monitor who goes in and goes, who goes out. They took counsel to kill him. And, you know, the, the other reason they wanted to kill him so bad is not only because he was lively in his preaching and zealous in his preaching and was more successful, but because he had seen, he had been such a remarkable disaster to the church. And being a Christian was a testimony against them. Like we, Paul, we saw all of us as we like you when you're a murderer. We like you when you're terrorizing people. We like you when you don't bring peace to this group of people called the people of the way. We like you that way. But then, when his testimony is working against them, they're plotting to kill him. They watch the gates day and night to kill him. They increase security within Damascus for the sake of one man. This man was troubled. <laughs> as much as he was troubled to the believers, they had no power to shut the gates. He's causing now trouble to the Jewish people. They want to make sure he goes down. Because they think that they have the power to do so. Now, Christ is showering Saul of Tarsus with what great things he must suffer for. <laughs> this is death at hand. What are you going to do about it? And you, you might be thinking, you know, is this the way for every other apostle, every other believer, or it's just me? I think maybe you've asked yourself some questions. You know, am I only suffering myself? <laughs> Are other Christians suffering in the world too? Or maybe if they're suffering, theirs is just kidogo, it's just small. I think I, I'm having the whole world on my shoulder. This is too heavy on me. Sometimes we think that way. We think we're the ones who are suffering. The rest of the people are it easy. They're enjoying life. But not this, friends. That where God gives great grace, He commonly exercises it with great trials. Where God gives great grace, He commonly exercises it with great trial. The plot was known to Him, and the disciple lowered Him with a large, what? Basket. Think about this means of transport. It's wonderful, right? <laughs> the, these baskets were not meant to ferry people through the walls or by the walls. These were technically like trash cans. To use them Trash and then you pour trash as we normally do in our homes. We, we have a specific corner for trash. <laughs> we have the, the big containers. <laughs> this is a man who came to Damascus before. He was coming into Damascus with glamour, with a lot of power, a lot of authority. Now he's in trouble. How is he going out? 
na kiondo. <laughs> Basket. This is no fun, friends. This is no fun. A place deserted, that is going to be a place where you're beginning your runaway. Every other person who is not in trouble with the Jewish people, they can walk in and out of the gate, no problem. And also think about it. They couldn't lower him closer to the gate, places that are different. They just lowered him through the back wall where they normally dump their trash. So as he's coming down, or as they're lowering him down, he's thinking, man, God, you're pretty interesting. Is this what you marked for me, really? I've always traveled with people. I've always been decent. And this is actually not clean. This is not decent. And all you'd be thinking, you know, God, if you have called this person, do you not have the ability of just shipping this guy from one location to another? He did that with Philip, right? He was, the, Philip enjoyed the most awesome mode of transport. Just from this location to that location, there's, there's, there's no back pain, there's no, your knees are not giving up on you, you're not getting thirsty, there's no problem. You just from this place and you're gone. And you'd be thinking, God, that would have been awesome for you to do. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Let them find me. Not. <laughs> now they see me. Now they don't. <laughs> but that was not the case. Because if it happened that way, then people would try to now, you know, write the schedule of how God does these things to people. He calls you, he does this, he does this, and this is how he's going to transport you. No, no, no. That is not how he does things. You cannot, you know, profile how he's going to do things. You cannot schedule his time and say, you know, he's going to do this at this time. This is how I'm going to get out. You know, this also shows us that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and will, with the temptations, also make a way to escape. He knows what you're going through. He set it up ahead of time. Listen, God will choose for us how we're going to travel this journey. All you need to do is to comply. He says, Lord, you have told me to go, I will go. Obey his voice. Whether you know how you're going to go there, that should not be a concern right now. But he was lowered. He escaped. And after escaping, he's going to go to Jerusalem. Here in Jerusalem, it's not like things are going to be easy. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. You see what he did? He tried. He tried to get into fellowship. He tried to be with them. He tried, friends. But it was not possible. Why? Because they still feared him. They know who he was. They still bear his past testimonies. I don't know if people get afraid of you. Oh, they're just fine. I always wonder until today what people think about me in my village. Because I terrorized people. I don't know what they think of me. 
all this, the, the, the thinking, I'm, you know, I'm faking things. I'm just, I want to be in the good books with the government, so you have to behave in this way. Just be cool. Hold your cool. I don't know what they say. But there is always someone somewhere who can give a testimony either. I don't know your position or where you are, but do you have people or someone who can give a testimony about you or they can only do it against you? Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. And that he had spoken to him. And how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Amazing. This is a man in trouble. He's trying to get into fellowship. And everyone is running away from him. What are you going to do? Just think about it. The, the people in the world, the non-believers, they're raging against you. They want to kill you. The people in the church wants to separate themselves from you. So where are you? Where do you find yourself? And what are you going to do? And truthfully, friends, if, if you find yourself in this time and season and you haven't really heard from the Lord, you can be tempted so many times to go back to the world. Like these church people, I thought they were the most loving people. I thought they were the most forgiving people. I thought they are supposed to accept us. The way they are forcing us to accept them with their things, right? The church should be the one loving people. Love me with my drunkenness. Love me with my issues. Love me with my queerness. No, no, no. The Lord had sin. He loves the sinner. He wants you to repent. But you got to let things go. If Paul really didn't hear from the Lord, if God didn't really spoke to him, say, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Arise and go. And you'll be told what you must do. And you know what he must do? He must suffer as he is preaching the gospel. You know, some of us, when we were, you know, being introduced to Christianity, we were told, man, you, your, your life now has changed. It's new life and you're not going to suffer anymore, you're not going to lack, you're not going to... I was like, Hure, I've been suffering for a long time. <laughs> Things are going to be in the silver plate, and voila, jackpot. Boop, boop. And then you get in. <laughs> no one reminds you of these things. You go through trouble, they try to encourage you here and, and there, and you're like, did you say that I will not suffer? And you know, they'll pray prayers, and sometimes I don't know if they did listen to the Holy Spirit that you, you know, there's no premature death upon your family, there's no this. We'll pray all these things as if we have the power to control things and to make things work. Did Saul of Tarsus pray against the suffering? Not at all. But we know later he cried, not one time, three times, that the Lord said, I'm not taking it away. Have fun with it. But my grace is sufficient. This man, Barnabas, hope you remember him. In the book of Acts, we started in chapter 4. He was amongst the Levites. His original name was Joseph or Joseph. They changed his name to Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement because they saw his ministry in the church. And his ministry, trust me, this, it, it went into the depths and it would be felt, it would be seen what he did for the people. 
And that is why God is using them even when the rest of the people are not seeing what Paul has become. He can attest for sure that this is the fruit of a man who is born again. The question is, do you have a Barnabas in your life? Someone who can speak on your behalf. Or everyone is speaking against you. I don't know. He brought him before the apostles. Say, this is who he was, and this is who he is right now. And you know what part of the testimony was? What Christ has done for him, and then what he has done since then for Christ. It's amazing. Because he said he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus Christ. How Barnabas came to know a lot of these things, we don't know. But you know, if something is your ministry and God has called you to a particular ministry, you will always find a way to work things out in your specific ministry. If, if, you know, God has graced you with the gift of mercy, you will always find people to serve. Right? Whatever ministry God has called you, you will always find that God will always open door for you to serve and be effective in that ministry. And Barnabas was very effective in that. So he brought him to the rest of the apostles. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. He's with them. When they go out, they go together. Coming in, they come in together. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, his very own people, but they attempted to kill him. Now see again. He disputed with these people. Do you know the reason we, we've said it already? But the reason why they're getting mad and getting agitated every time is because no one and none of them can stand against Saul of Tarsus. What he knows is beyond them. So if they know for sure that he is standing to prove the cause of Christ, they know that they're in, in trouble. I mean, he knows everything. You talk about the law. He's been following in it to the latter. He knows everything. And now that he's a believer, he's a follower of Jesus Christ, and he's making case for Christ, the case for Christ. They wanted to take him out. And when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea. And sent him out to Tarsus. <laughs> like, hey, you want to go, bo- go back home? <laughs> you soul of Tarsus, right? Can you at least go back home and think about your life? You are endangered. In Damascus, you just escaped. In Jerusalem, they want to kill you. Try your home and see if your own people there will kill you or what will happen. But we know that all these things that are happening, they are by the design of God to mold this man to become who he wants him to be. We see how sharp his enemies were upon him. Why? Because he was admitted into the communion of the disciples. Which was no little provocation to his enemies. Like he's with them. The people that we don't like, he's working with them. This was not easy. And it vexed them. It vexed the unbelieving Jews to see 
Saul a trophy of Christ's victory. Wow. They got agitated that now these people in this other side, they are going to win against us because we cannot debate Paul. We cannot debate him. None of us can do. He had been a champion for their cause. But to see him coming against them was so hard on them. And to hear them, you know, talking well about him and to glorify God for the sake of him, these things are getting into their necks every day. He appeared vigorous in the cause of Christ. And this was yet more the provocation for these people. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not this friend. That those that speak for Christ have the reason to speak boldly. Those that speak for Christ have the reason to speak boldly for they have a good reason. They have a good cause to do so. Look from the time, from the inception of the church, they have always preached Christ boldly. And in fact, when they would go through hard times, you know what their prayer was? Please, God, give us boldness and open the doors. We are not backing down. We want to do it. And we are ready to do it. Boldness. And God has always been faithful on that. He's given them boldness and he's opened the door. But this door, they, they, they don't choose how they are opened. God just, in his providence, he leads them through. He leads them through. And so the Hellenists, they get agitated, but Saul of Tarsus has a good reason to boldly speak for Jesus Christ. Do you have a bold reason to testify of Jesus Christ? Many of us will shy off. Many of us will run away. Many of us will, we, we wouldn't want to get ourselves in the middle where, you know, there's a heated discussion. We want to run away. Would you run away when God is calling you? So this is the first aspect that we see. This man has just begun what he was taught. He must suffer for my name's sake. He must suffer. He disputed with his Hellenists and they wanted to kill him. And then the brethren helped him out. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. That is a lot of things happening there. Before Jesus went back to heaven, you remember what he said? That you will be my witnesses. Where? In Judea, in, in, in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost. But see what is happening here. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, had peace and were edified. So amidst the things that are happening to Saul of Tarsus, there is a lot of trouble in Damascus, in Jerusalem, and, you know, they're keeping an eye 
on him. Also in the church, people are being empowered and they're growing in their most holy faith. And you see a few aspects that are happening here. That number one, they had the peace of God. Number two, they were edified, meaning there were people who consistently divided the word of truth, taught them God's word. They were edified. They were encouraged in the Lord. And number two, when that happens, they walked in the fear of the Lord. They walked in the fear of the Lord. You remember this word was used when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. After that, the Bible told us that everyone feared. Or there was the reverence for God, what he is able to do. They feared the Lord. And then they were comforted by the Holy Spirit. And lastly, as a result of all these things, they multiplied. They multiplied in number. You know, the, the, the Lord does not add to his church because we have better programs. He adds to the church because we are keeping his commandments. Not the ten ones. Because those, we, 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 we're not able to uh, keep those in, in ourselves. To say, you know, okay, you know, thou shalt not worship other gods, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, all these things. We are not able to keep one of those things, right? We break them. Because if you break one, you break all. We, we're not able to keep those. We are able to walk in the power of God because he is with us. He empowers us to do his will above all else. That is what happened to the church. And now we, we're going to take a, a, a break in a few chapters and it's going to go back to Peter and the rest of the apostles. And then we'll come back to, I believe, ch chapter 13 and then Paul will continue until the end, you know, visiting churches and planting and writing letters to the churches. But here we have, Peter is reintroduced here again. It says, and now it came to pass as Peter went through all the parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwell in Lida. And he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and take your bed. That was not complicated, right? He finds a man who is been there for eight years. He's, he's paralyzed. He's, he's helpless. He's, you know, all these things. We, we don't know what uh, his own people were thinking about him. Maybe they said, you know, this man is cursed. Maybe, you know, their parents did this, and that is why he's going through a lot of things in life. We don't know what people said about him, but all we know is that he was bedridden for eight years. That was a long time to be, you know, not feeling well. You, you, you get a headache for one day, you think you're going to die the next minute. You know, eight years. Now, think about it, eight years. Some of us, a mosquito will bite us and we don't come to church the next morning. Say, what happened? Man, these crazy mosquitoes, evil creatures, I don't know why God allowed them to. This, what happened? I was attacked by safari ants. The, the reason that people give not to attend fellowship, sometimes they're like, oh, the Lord is gracious, you know. 
the Lord knows you better than we know. But the reason that would keep me of fellowship, I'm, I'll be nearly dying. I don't remember one time since receiving Christ, one time sitting at home because I just didn't like going to church that day. <laughs> I didn't feel like, you know, I didn't feel like, you know how you wake up and you don't feel like, you know, <laughs> you don't feel like going to church. Or you want to stay at your jammies and Watch us online. <laughs> it's wonderful. Right? The things that we have approved, we've given this approval and stamped them. We have convinced ourselves that this is good for me today. I didn't feel like, you know, I was tired the whole week. And nee, nee, nee. We, we, some situation we would understand. There are some times we just don't understand how you would stay at home. There's one time I was just about to stay home because I went for sports and they broke my leg. I was barely walking. I limped to the church. And when I get to the chapel, they brought the piano where I was to play and sing. Heartless people. They don't care about me. <laughs> but we are called to serve the Lord. We are called to be together. Every other time, you know, the enemy speaks things that would bring a separation, run away from it. Run away from it. Because there's COVID, people are supposed to be separated from one another. People are going to die because they are not close to one another. We're just not meant to be that way. We are meant to be together. You know what he said to this man? Jesus the Christ heals you. Now, he, there, there, there were not a lot of gymnastics. They're like, I capture this spirit of death. I bind it back to sender. Send it back to hell. Do all these things. No, 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 no. And he even didn't say, I heal you in the name of Jesus. No, 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 no. When they were asked for, you know, some coins... You remember at the gate called beautiful, he says, silver and gold, we have none. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed so that you will not come back for more coins. You can make them yourself. That is better, right? <laughs> because at the end of the day, you will die. You won't live here forever. All these miracles we see, these people, they don't live forever. They die. If your ministry or a ministry is based upon the physical miracles, run away. Run away for your life. Don't stay there. Say, Jesus, the Christ, heals you. In other words, this has nothing to do with me. I'm just a vessel. But Jesus Christ, he has mercy on you and he's healing you. And what was the result of this healing? So all who dwelt at Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now when this physical miracle happened, now an eternal one came and was bad. Because when people are turning to the Lord, they have security in him for eternity. Our physical, you can be healed. You can be healed and not think about the heavenly. So just thinking about, man, I was this, I'm not that. You're not, think, you're not bound to think about the heavenly things. But the good news is that people received Christ. As I bring the worship team to come, to conclude in these few verses. And also, verses 36, at Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works, and 
charitable deeds which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in, the, in an upper room. And since Lida was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, employing him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then Peter gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. And so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon Atana. We'll get into this man Simon and the rest of Peter's stay here. But think about it. This is one miracle in this location. And then they heard that Peter was in town somewhere, sent men to go get him. And Peter came very quickly. And I believe as this is happening, you know, he's being brought to uh, an upper room where a woman is lying there, helpless, dead. Not even helpless, she's dead. And customarily, this is what they did. When someone dies close to immediately, they would wash them, they would wipe them with warm water. Warm. So that if there was any life remaining in them, they would be able to see and find a way of saving them. And this was not the case with Dorcas. She was gone. And what they did after she was washed, they anointed her. You remember the oil that Mary brought before Jesus, anointing Jesus to prepare him for his death? This was dead, and she was, you know, oiled, and they did wrap her with the burial clothes. But they did not take her to the tomb yet. Because they heard that the apostle was in town, they took her up to the upper room, a possible place where they used to fellowship and have fellowship with other people. But I love what, you know, the apostle did. When Peter saw all these things, he did what? He did send them all out. And I believe he's remembering what Jesus did when he was called when a young girl had died. You remember? She was 12 years of, old, of age. And you know what Jesus said also? You know, telling people, encouraging people not to weep because she's only asleep. He did send people out of the room. And in Aramaic, he said, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, young girl, arise. And he presented this girl to the parents and people celebrated. And I believe this man, Peter, remembered what Jesus did. And the first thing that he did, he went down on his knees and prayed. Before a miracle, he remembered that he does not possess the power to do anything. He is only but a servant who is trusting the Lord. And what he did was this, prayed. And you know what he said? Tabitha kumi. Tabitha, arise. What an interesting thing to remember the, the Lord Jesus Christ in your ministry. 
that the very same things he did, these are the exact things you're going to do. And Jesus also said, the things you see me do are the things I see my father do. In your ministry, whatever you're called to do, are you doing your things or you're doing the things that Jesus would have done? Where do you find yourself? And the result of this is that it was known throughout and the people believed on the Lord. A physical miracle, then an eternal security comes to people because they are believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not told that Tabitha is still alive right now. She was dead, brought back to life, but you know what? She died again. But if you're born again, though we will physically die, we shall see him. We have an assurance to be with the Father, to see him one more time. I don't know where your security is. This was a woman of good character. You know, they were built up in their most holy faith. They walked in the fear of the Lord. Walked in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. These believers. And we see that the church is growing. And also, we see this disciple. One that had embraced Christ. Embraced the faith of Christ. And was baptized. And on only so, but she was eminent above many for her works of charity. She showed her faith by her works. She showed her faith by her works. Remember James says to us that faith without works is dead. In other words, her faith was alive. Is yours today alive or it's dead? Where is your faith, child of God? The Lord who calls you, the Lord who calls every us, every one of us, He knows the way. He prepares the way. We might not like how He's doing it, but He is right in what He does. He's righteous. There's justice in him. He's holy. Whatever he does, he does it for your own interest, for your good. Even when Paul was going through all this suffering, it's for the sake of the gospel. Jesus died and his death was to save us. He laid down his life for the sake of the other. Maybe you're, you're feeling alone or lonely. I don't know if you have a Barnabas with you somewhere, someone who can encourage you, someone who can walk with you when things are tough. Not even when things are tough, probably they're tough right now on your side. You're wondering on the next step, you're wondering on what to do, you're wondering the decision you're making, are they right or I'm just doing my own things? The Lord is always there. If we will have the discernment to know, the discernment to walk with Him and to understand how He's leading us, we will count it all joy. The Bible tells us that friends and brothers count it all joy when you go through various trials and temptations. Count it all joy. But another thing that I must tell us, you know, when we're seeing this, you know, the, this, the growth of the church and Saul of Tarsus is defending the cause of the gospel, there are miracles and the church is experiencing peace, they are edified, you know, 
the reason why all these things are happening because people are with the Lord. They are studying God's word. They are praying every day. Sometimes we look for things that are, you know, we, we, we need seven steps on how to hear the voice of God. You don't need seven. You just need to sit quiet and read the Bible. Talk to God. He will talk back to you. You don't need to complicate it. You know, how, how is it we, with our relationship, those who are married or those who have fiancés? You know, your, your spouse will come and speak and speak, and, and when he's done or she's done, she's gone. You're like, whoa, whoa, what about me? What about my heart? What about what I want to say to you? What about my response to you? What about me? And that is what we do with God. We have a list, like a shopping list. Nine of us is checked, checked. When you're done, you are reconfirming again. Do I have everything? Check, check. And then pay and leave. That is what we do with God. We just speak. We speak. We say things. But we never find a quiet time for God to speak back. For God to speak back. Train yourself to listen to God. Meditate upon His Word. Meditate upon His Word. I mean, you cannot meditate upon something you haven't read, so that means you must read the Bible, read the Bible, and then you meditate upon it. Try praying for 10 minutes and sitting still for 20 minutes. Because we are never still. You sit for three minutes and then. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever sites, whatever things. We, we, our minds are preoccupied with things that we've carried in our pockets. May the Lord help us, church. May the Lord help us as we think about his word. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we have as your people to gather together in your name. And even as we learn these things, as we see the sufferings and, you know, sometimes we feel like, you know, we've, we've not been accepted in a particular fellowship. We, we, what we do is like going unnoticed. Lord, if we're doing it for you, it doesn't matter. We know that there's crown that is awaiting for us in heaven. Lord, help us to even take our, you know, our minds and our hearts to, to receive the glory of the things we are doing here on earth. Help our hearts, Lord. Help our unbelief. And even when we are growing, we pray that we will uh, be diligent to continue seeking after you, to continue sharing, to continue encouraging others. Maybe we are the Barnabases of other people. I pray that you will help us even to identify those people that we need to talk to, we need to encourage. Thank you, God. And if there's anyone amongst us who is has missed the mark, Lord, I pray that you would draw them back to you. Anyone going through hard times, I pray the Lord, you will encourage them. If you so desire that they go through whatever they are, I pray that you give them your grace. Give them your grace. And we thank you, God. This morning as we give to you, our finances, we pray that we'll give that which will bring glory and honor to you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.